All right. Curly said, you go in Soledad and get a cop. Get Al Wiltz. He's deputy sheriff. Let's go now. He turned suspicious on George. You're coming with us, fella. Yeah, said George. I'll come. But listen, Curly, the poor bastard nuts. Don't shoot him. He didn't do what he was doing. He didn't know what he was doing. Don't shoot him, Curly said. He got Curly's Luger. Of course we'll shoot him, George said weakly. Maybe Carlson lost his gun. I seen it this morning, said Carlson. No, it's been took. Slim stood, look, Slim stood looking down at Curly's wife. He said, Curly, maybe you better stand here with your wife. Curly's face reddened. I'm going, he said. I'm going to shoot the guts out of that big bastard myself, even if I only got one hand. I'm going to get him. Slim turned to candy. You say you you stay here with her then, Candy. The rest of us better get going. Uh, they moved away. George stopped a moment beside Candy, and they both looked down at the dead girl until Curly called. You, George, you stick with us so we don't think you had nothing to do with this. George moved slowly with them, and his feet dragged heavily. And when they were gone, Candy squatted down in the hay and watched the face of Curly's wife. Poor bastard, he said softly. The sound of the men grew fainter. The barn was darkening gradually, and in their stalls, the horses shifted their feet and rattled the halter chains. Old Candy lay down in the hay and covered his eyes with his arms. With his arm. The deep green pool of the Salatus River was still in the late afternoon. Already the sun had left the valley to go climbing up the slopes of the Gibbeland Mountains, and the hilltops were rosy in the sun. But by the pool along among the modded sacamores, a pleasant shade had fallen. A water snake glided smoothly up the pool, twisting its periscope head from side to side, and it swam the length of the pool and came to the legs of the motionless heron that stood in the shallows. A silent head and beak uh, lanced down and plucked it out of by the head, and the beak swallowed the little snake while it was tail waved frantic while its tail waved frantically. Yum. A far rush of wind sounded, and a gust drove through the tops of the trees like a wave. The sacamore leaves turned up their silver sides. The brown, dry leaves on the ground scudded a few feet, and row and on row of tiny wind waves flowed up the pool's green surface. As quickly as it had come, the wind died, and the clearing was quiet again. The heron stood in the shallows, motionless and waiting. Another little water snake swam up the pool, uh, turning its periscope from side to side. Suddenly, Lenny appeared out of the brush, and he came as silently as a creeping bear move, moves. The heron pounded the air with its wings, jacked itself clear of the water, and flew off down the river. The little snake, the little snake slid in among the reeds at the pool's side. Lenny came quietly to the pool's edge. He knelt down and drank, barely touching his lips to the water. When the little bird skittered over the dry leaves behind him, his head jerked up and he, stained, he strained toward the sound with his eyes and ears until he saw the bird. And then he dropped his head and drunk again. When he was finished, he sat down on the bank and with his side to the pool so that he could watch the trails and, and, and uh, entranced. He embraced his knees and laid his chin down on his knees. The light climbed on out of the valley, and as it went, the top of the mountain seemed to blaze with uh, increasing brightness. Lenny said softly, I didn't forget you. I didn't forget you, bet. God damn it. Hide in the brush and wait for George. He pulled his hat down over his eyes. George gonna give me a hell, said, he said. George gonna wish he was alone and not have me bothering him. He turned his head and looked at the bright mountaintops. I can go right off there and find a cave, he said. And he continued sadly, and never have no ketchup. 
but I don't care. If George don't want me, I'll go away. I'll go away. And then, and then from out of Lenny's he head, there came a little fat old woman. What? And then from out of Lenny's head, there came a little fat old woman. She wore thick bull, bullseye glasses, and she wore a huge a gingham apron with pockets and she was starched starched and clean she stood in front of Lenny and put her hand on her hips and she frowned disapprovingly at him and when she spoke it was Lenny's voice I'll tell you and you tell you I, I told you and told you she said I told you me and George because he's such a nice fella and good to you but you don't never take no care you do bad things and Lenny answered I tried Aunt Clara ma'am I tried I tried I couldn't help it you never give a thought to George she went on in Lenny's voice he's Le oh she went on in Lenny's voice he been doing nice things for you all the time when he got a piece of pie you always get half or more of it and if there was any ketchup why'd he give all of it to you i know said lenny miserably i tried aunt clara ma'am i tried and tried she interrupted him all the time he could have all the time he could have had such a good time if it wasn't for you he would have told his prey and raised hell in a whorehouse and he could have sat in a pool room and played snooker uh but you got to take care of you Lenny moaned with grief. I know, Aunt Clara, ma'am. I'll go right off in the hills, and I'll find a cave, and I'll live there, so I won't be no bother to trouble the George. You just say that, she said sharply. You're always saying that, and you know, son of a bitchin' well, you ain't gonna do it. You'll just stick around and stew the bejesus out of George all the time. Lenny said, I might just as well go away. George ain't gonna let me tend to no rabbits now. Aunt Clara was gone, and from out of Lenny's head, there came a gigantic rabbit. It sat on its haunches in front of him, and it waggled its ears and crinkled its nose at him, and it spoke in Lenny's voice too. Tend rabbits, it said scornfully. You crazy bastard. You ain't fit to lick the boot of no rabbits. You'd forget them and let them go hungry. That's what you'd do, and then what would you think? And then what do you think George would think? I would not forget, Lenny said loudly. The hell you wouldn't, said the rabbit. You ain't worth a grease jackpin to ram you into hell. Christ knows George done everything he could to jack you out of the sewer, but it ain't don't but it ain't don't do no good. If you think George's gonna let you tend rabbits, you're even crazier than usual. He ain't. He's gonna beat the hell out of you with a stick. That's what he's gonna do. Now, Lenny uh, retorted belligerently. He ain't neither. George won't do nothing like that. I know George since I forget when. And he ain't never raised his hand to me with a stick. He's nice to me. He ain't gonna be mean. Well, he's sick of you. Sick of the rabbit. He gonna beat the hell out of you, then go away and leave you. He won't, Lenny cried frantically. He won't do anything like that. I know, George, me and him travel together. But the rabbit repeated softly over and over. He gonna leave, you crazy bastard. He's gonna leave you alone. He gonna leave, you crazy bastard. Lenny put his hand over his ears. He ain't, I tell you, he ain't. And he cried, oh, George, George, George. George came quietly out of the brush and rabbit scuttered back into Lenny's brain. George said quietly, what the hell are you yelling about? Lenny got up on his knees. You ain't gonna leave me, are you, George? I know you ain't. George came stiffly near and sat down beside him. No, I knowed it, Lenny cried. You ain't that kind. George was silent. Lenny said, George? Yeah, I done another bad thing. It don't make no diff difference, George said and he fell silent again. Only the topmost ridges were in the sun now. The shadow in the valley was blue and soft. From a distance came the sound of men shouting to one another. George turned his head and listened to the shouts. Lenny said, George. Lenny said, George. Yeah? Ain't you gonna give me hell? Give you hell? 
like sure like you always done before like if i didn't have you have you i'd take my 50 bucks jesus christ lenny you ain't remember nothing that happens but you remember every word i say well ain't you gonna say it george shook himself he said woodenly if i was alone i could live so easily his voice was mono monotonous he had no emphasis I could get a job and have no mess, he stopped. Go on, said Lenny, and when the ends the month come, and when the end of the month come, I could take my 50 bucks and go on to a cat house. He stopped how, he stopped again. Lenny looked eagerly at him. Go on, George, ain't you gonna give me no more hell? No, said George. Well, I can go away, said Lenny. I'll go right off in the hills and find a cave if you don't want me. George shook himself again. No, he said. I want you to stay with me here. Lenny said craftily, tell me like you've done before. Tell you what? About the other guys and about us. George said, guys like us got no family. They make a little stake in and then they blow it at, in it. They ain't got nobody in the, war, in the world. That gives a hoot in the hell about them. But not us, Lenny cried happily. Tell about us now. George was quiet for a moment. But not us, he said. Because? Because I got you and... And I got you, we got each other, and that's what? That gives a hoot and hell about us, Lenny cried in triumph. triumph. The little evening br breeze blew over the clearing and the leaves rustled and the wind waves flowed up the green pool and the shouts of men sounded again, this time much closer than before. George took off his hat. He said shakily, take off your hat, Lenny. The air feels fine.